over the mic to our student coordinator for today, that's Kaina. Um, I, would all, I would like to welcome the speaker and I would also like to welcome our professors who are here with us. Um, I see Smita Ma'am and Priyanka Ma'am. Um, with that, I'll hand it over to our student coordinator, Kaina. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kainat Kuraishi, and I welcome you to the second talk of the October theme that is Lost Heritage, The Legacy No More by History Department of Lady Shiram College for Women for the session of 2021 and 22. Our talk is on the Central Vista project, reworking a heritage site with our eminent speaker, Dr. Sopna Lidl. Dr. Sopna Lidl is a historian and an author who specializes in the history of she fell in love with the city of Delhi after arriving there as a college student. The love led to a PhD on the history of the city and in efforts to preserve its rich built heritage. She has written about the cultural and intellectual life of the 19th century Shah Zahanabad in her book Chani Chow and the Making of New Delhi. She is also closely involved in the movement to preserve heritage monuments and sites and spreads her love for the city by conducting heritage walks at different monuments. Before we ask Dr. Liddell to take the stage, I would request everyone to switch on their cameras if possible. Also, kindly keep yourself muted in the duration of the talk. Once we open the floor for the questions, you can choose to unmute and put forward your questions or write them in the chat box for us to take them on, on your behalf. Welcome, ma'am. The stage is all yours. Thank you so much, Kainat, and uh, thank you so much uh, to the Society for uh, inviting me to talk on this project. I, I never need a second invitation to talk about Delhi. I'm always happy to uh, speak about various uh, aspects of it. And uh, uh, in this series on lost heritage, I'm going to be talking about the Central Vista project. And of course, it's been very much in the news and uh, this is not so much as lost, but what we may lose. And uh, also uh, how uh, the site has changed over the decades that it's been around. And <clears throat> I think uh, one or two things that one needs to really begin to talk about and what I'm going to do is I'm going to start, um, I have some slides which uh, will illustrate this talk. So I'm going to start presenting now. <clears throat> As I talk, you can see some of the pictures that I'll uh, be showing also. So <clears throat> let me get on with that aspect. Um, we need to, I think, think about what is heritage a little bit. Because when we talk about heritage in the sense of heritage sites, uh, we must realize that, uh, sorry, uh, yeah. Can you see the, the window? Maybe yes, I, can, uh, uh, I can use a um, slide. If I use a slide mode, it might be better, right? Or is it okay? Is that, is that good enough? Or should I use a slide? Yes. Is yes. that good enough? Yes. Oh. Yes. All right, fine. So then I will, I will uh, continue to use this. So uh, I think what we need to understand is that when we are talking about built heritage, we are talking obviously about uh, a site that has human intervention, has a history of human intervention. Often we talk about sites which are connected to important events or important people or important eras in uh, 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 place the, the history of, yeah, of human history. So uh, in the terms of built heritage. So uh, that is there. I. It becomes a little bit more complicated when you're talking about a living heritage site because when you talk about living heritage, of course, you are also talking about a site which is not simply got those layers of history and uh, everything. It is also a functioning, an everyday functioning place which uh, does not only have meaning for uh, 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 people and the population, 
but it is in new constant use. So that is a very important part of uh, the concept of a heritage site, that a living heritage site, which needs, uh, which, which which needs to be uh, looked at in this context. So, uh, Central Vista, a little bit about. Uh, the history. I think history I don't need to talk about much. It's part of New Delhi, the capital that the British built in the in, uh, for the British Indian Empire in the 19... Most of the construction took place in the 1910s and 20s. So one of the things that we need to ask when we're talking about heritage is what, what are the components of heritage? What are the components of heritage? What gives a site meaning as heritage? And uh, one of the things that does indeed give a side meaning is the intent of the original uh, or the people who have built that site. So in this case, it is this intent, this imperial intent that we have to look at. And uh, for that, we have to go back to 1911 when this idea of building this new city came about. And uh, I think a lot of the problem with New Delhi is that its intent often is not clearly understood. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time about this. Now, the proposal to transfer the capital from Calcutta to Delhi and to create a new city was evolved in the Vice Prize Council. And one of the people involved there was Guy Fleetwood Wilson, who was the finance member of the council. And in putting this together, one of the very important considerations was that in changing the capital that the Raj, the British Raj had to be given an image makeover. It had to be given, uh, it had to be presented differently to the Indian people because the, uh, the strategy of dealing with the rising national movement by authoritarian steps like the partition of Bengal uh, and uh, repressive measures had actually proved to be a failure. And the rising Swadeshi movement, the rising Congress movement had uh, uh, proved that these were not things that could work anymore. And that kind of comes across very, very clearly in this correspondence that we read when we talk about what uh, the correspondence that is taking place advocating or debating the transfer of capital. And this is what Fleetwood Wilson says, that we shall have to resort to the more difficult arts of persuasion and conciliation in the place of the easier methods of democracy. It is no longer easy because it's proving counterproductive. You cannot deal with the national movement by repressive means. So what you have to do is you have to repackage the Raj and present it as something that uh, is more palatable to the Indian people. And what is uh, what they think is more palatable is repackaging it as something that the that that this is a it is a, a empire that is for Indians. It is working for Indians. It is in the long line of Indian empires that and therefore a very important part of that was to the transfer of capital to Delhi was to draw on the city's aura as a capital of empires because Delhi had been the capital during the Sultanate for a, quite a bit of the Mughal Empire as well. So to de, to go back to those and the announcement that the capital is going to be changed is also happens during the Darbar. This photograph that you see is one of the images from one of the events of the coronation Darbar when George V was crowned in Delhi. Uh, to show that, you know, we are also in the same line. This is exactly the window which Haruka and which the Mughal emperors used to give darshan to their subjects. So, drawing on that era, uh, that, that aura of power, the tradition, the Mughal tradition, to say that we are also an Indian empire is a very important part. Delhi, again, Harding uh, emphasized this, that Delhi is still a name to conjure with. He's trying to uh, say why Delhi should be the capital and he talks about how it is associated in the mind of the Hindus with sacred legends. He's talking here about Indaprastha which go back even beyond the dawn of history 
to the Muslims, it would be a source of unbounded gratification to see the ancient capital of the Mughals restored to its proud position as the seat of the empire. Now, he, of course, being uh, uh, trained in a you know British intellectual tradition of seeing India as two uh, nations, the Hindus and the Muslims, is putting it in this manner. But what he actually means is that Indians consider uh, Delhi as an important seat of power. So therefore, we must choose Delhi. When the foundation stones were laid, the foundation stones were laid during the Darbar celebrations themselves, at the same time as the Darbar celebrations in North Delhi. And there, the invitation which uh, was sent out to people said that this event is inaugurating the restoration of Delhi as the capital of India. So to say that Delhi will once again be the capital like it had been before. So that kind of, uh, so the politics of it is interesting. It, it's important to understand this, what that legacy uh, or what that heritage is that creates New Delhi. What is the imperial intent? And that uh, happens again in the debates when it comes to, okay, we have decided Delhi is going to be the capital. Now what, which, which place in Delhi? One of the, now this is the map which shows uh, broadly the contours of historic Delhi. So uh, historically Delhi has been, the historic cities of Delhi have lain within what we call the Delhi Triangle. And you can see the Delhi Triangle here in the sense of the river Yamuna there and the ridge. If you can see, I hope this is large enough because I don't get a very clear idea of how uh, my uh, screen is appearing to everybody else. I hope you can see the whole screen. So this, so the first was the North Delhi site that was given up because of various reasons. One being that it flooded very badly. Site number two, they, which they considered, was in Shahadara, on the other side of the river. That also was problematic because. Uh, there was the river, uh, you know, it meant that the older city, which was Shah Janabad, which you see in pink just now, and the new city would be separated by the river and it would make logistics problematic. The third site, which you see, is the great, it was a big plain level area in Narayana. And Narayana was an old site. Narayana was a very suitable site, but they decided no. And the reason they decided no, Narayana was not suitable was because it lay outside this Delhi triangle. And they said it cannot be considered to be Delhi. This is not Delhi because it has to be within that triangle of Delhi. So the idea that, that the symbolism of that triangular piece of land within which Delhi has to be located, which the new Delhi has to be located so it can be connected to the older sites, that idea was a very, very strong one. So it, because of that, the default was, uh, site then was what I have labeled in this map number four, which is what later developed as Raisina. So that becomes very important to understand that it, it is of crucial importance to see the past in order to locate the city of Delhi. And of course, as you know, uh, then the city comes up. What you see in red is the city plan. And in the city plan, again, there is a great, sorry, emphasis on what exactly is the plan going to be. So in the plan, there are a few important, uh, shall we say, vistas. Now, a vista is literally a view that you see probably at the end of a line of sight. So those vistas are very important. One of those vistas goes from the score, which is the middle of the secretariat buildings, uh, right to Jama Masjid. And I will show you this with an animation, hopefully. Can you see the, uh, you'll be able to see the animation. So the two important vistas, which actually form the city, one is the line which goes right up to Jama Masjid. The second line goes straight to Purana Kila. So two important sites are at the end of vistas. These two important vistas are there. What we today call the central vista 
is the lower one, the one going from the central secretariats right up to Purana Kila. That is Central Vista, that is Rajpath, that is the one. But in this animation, I have also pointed out another uh, road, and that is Chami Chowk. And you will see how Rajpath is exactly parallel to Chami Chowk, that particular road in Old Delhi. So it is through these, uh, even the town plan, how it is made is, uh, it, it is a, it, it takes as its reference points important historical sites and uh, the imperial, older imperial avenue is taken into consideration uh, to uh, decide on the town plan. So that, as I said, important part of the heritage of the site. Then comes the architecture and here again in, when you are talking about the architecture, at the highest levels when this conversation is happening, when this debate is happening about what is to be the style in which this new you know what 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 is going to what is the uh, you know what is New Delhi a product of, and this is how Edwin Montague, uh, who's the Under Secretary of State, who is kind of uh, discussing all these. He's the same Montague as you you know the uh, Montague Chelmsford reforms guy, and uh, what he is saying is that we are going to take two different traditions and we are going to meld them together. So he says that anyway. Uh, you will see that. Uh, uh, quotation, you can save that quotation for to later. It's in a very uh, somewhat flowery terms, but what it is again saying is, and this is all internal correspondence, this is not meant for a public, uh, a public relations exercise, right? This is internal conversation that is happening between in official circles. And they're saying that we need to bring two civilizations together, two traditions together. So that is uh, a very important part of how this the architecture is conceived of and that's the result of it of that conversation is the architecture of New Delhi and uh, here I'm going to take one example of Rashtrapati Bhavan and give you a few uh, very I mean you know that's not the main purpose of this talk but I will I think it needs to be talked about also uh, what is the kind of architecture that is developing one of them one uh, important parallel with older traditions is the color of, the, is the material that is used for the cladding. So the red sandstone, the beige sandstone, these are materials with which a lot of Teddy's uh, old buildings are uh, constructed. So that that is uh, there. Architectural details. When Lutyens, Edwin Lutyens and Herbert Baker, who were both trained in a Western classical architectural tradition. Neoclassical was their uh, uh, preferred mode. When they are appointed, the kind of things that they are trying to conceive of, they are looking, they were architects, they were looking at the older traditions of Rome as a model for uh, an empire. But then again, the politics comes in very quickly because Harding, who's the viceroy, immediately says, this will not do. You are making a building that is uh, uh, a renaissance building or a neoclassical building. This is not an Indian building. You have to go back to the drawing board and look at the kind of things that uh, you really need to, uh, you know, look at it again. And Latians is sent back and Latians is sent uh, and Baker are sent on these tours of uh, Central India and North India to go and take inspiration from Indian, for, uh, for, uh, from Indian traditions to reinterpret what they think the building should be like. And their uh, result, of course, is something like this, uh, which is uh, Rashtrapati Bhavan. Uh, if you look at the dome, I'm sure uh, you have, uh, this, this has been, uh, you must have heard about this. The dome is modeled on the Sanchi Stupa. The, the drum of the dome, which is like a railing, the top, which is flattened, you can see the parallels over here quite, uh, this is the great Stupa in Sachi. Um, you can see the parallels there. The There are these two large elephants, which uh, this is the southern entrance, and you can see as you approach uh, the Jaipur column, you can see these large, life, almost life-size elephants on either side. And uh, they are definitely taking inspiration from the Red Fort, which also has these two large elephants on the southern gate. Unfortunately, we don't see this gate too often, but this is the 
uh, southern or so-called Delhi gate that uh, uh, is, is there. So that kind of inspiration is being taken. Also from the Mughal gardens, inspiration is taken. This is the Mughal garden in Viceroy's house. And it is quite clear that uh, it was definitely modeled on Indian gardens and uh, particularly the uh, gardens that were introduced in India by the Mughals. Uh, and here's Babar in a miniature painting supervising the laying out of a garden. This is from the Babar Nama. And then, of course, is the other buildings. Uh, the same kind of uh, uh, the same kind of architecture is used for the other buildings as well. For instance, this one, which is the central, uh, central secretariat. This is not block to be specific. I get the same kind of colors as in Prashtapati Bhavan, the same kind of chhatris, the little cupolas that you see. These kind of things are, uh, it's a part of the architecture of this. Now, the other thing that you have to realize is it is not only in the buildings that the Indianness of these uh, in the, in the structures, in the materials that the, the Indianness of these buildings lies. Because even though uh, Rashtrapati Bhavan, which at that time was Viceroy's house, was occupied obviously by the Viceroy, in the Indian Secretariat's by the Secretariat building started functioning in about 1926. And by that time, there is a significant percentage of the personnel working in that Secretariat building are in fact Indians. They had for a long time filled uh, many of the positions among the clerical and other staff, but by this time, even in the upper levels of the bureaucracy, such as the Indian civil service, there were uh, Indians were making their uh, presence felt. So the secretariat building, when it opens, not only does it look uh, that it has parallels with Indian architecture, though not entirely, it is a hybrid building, but it still has it, but more importantly, it also has Indians working. In it. So it is inscribed at that level by uh, that uh, uh, presence of Indians. Now that actually gets hugely emphasized with the coming of independence. Because what happens at independence is that these buildings, this new capital, becomes the capital of a new independent Indian nation. And uh, these buildings, this cap the imperial buildings, are reappropriated and reinscribed with a nationalist idiom. So it's Indian, the Indian nationalist national rituals that are incorporated within these buildings. Uh, this is a beautiful uh, photograph of what that same chhatri that you saw in the previous photograph of the sec secretariat building with the. Camels, the Camel Regiment, which stands here during the beating of the retreat. So, these are new traditions that are being evolved, which uh, Indianize the site, make it a part of Indian tradition. And of course, the, the beating the retreat ceremony it has been going on all through. And it has that, uh, it is in our minds inscribed with the tradition of independent India, nothing to do with colonial rule. Similarly, is the case with Parliament House. Parliament House actually has an even stronger, uh, uh, shall we say, uh, if, you're, if you're looking at an Indian uh, headed history, because this building, right from the very beginning, it is Indian elective rep elected representatives who have sat here, because the reforms of 1919 uh, enlarged the uh, account the council. And in fact, that's what made a council house necessary. And therefore, this council house was built as a separate thing from the uh, from the viceroy's house. It was separate. It was a separate arm of government. And it was built as such. And right from the very beginning, it had Indian representatives. Again, with the coming of independence, it gains a whole new meaning because this is where not only Indian representatives sit, but this is where they sit and they... Uh, debates the Indian constitution, they pass the Indian constitution. It is intimately linked to the history of independent India. Right down to this day, every single uh, house, uh, you know, uh, Lok Sabha, Rajya Sabha, they have sat in this house and have uh, in large part, uh, you know, evolved the laws of the land. So, so 
the building, it's not just the building. You may say that the building was built by colonial rulers, but the building was built in response to an Indian demand for greater representation, first of all. That is why the building is built, because these reforms were demanded. And more importantly, since then, it has been inscribed with one of the most important institutions of Indian uh, of the Indian nation. So it has a what we call an intangible heritage, which is linked to it. It has a so heritage is all about it's it's about buildings, but it's not just about buildings. It's about buildings and the meaning that they hold, and uh, bringing the the Central Vista project into the picture now, uh, the new project, the new project to discard this building and to create a new one. That is the. That is the question that has to be asked. There is going to be a fracture in the in the history and the tradition of in the Indian Parliament, which associates this building with an institution and a particular history of that institution. So that is the that, that's the that's a fracture that we're going to look at, which we will definitely lose when we when our parliamentarians cease to sit in this building. So. The building as a museum is, or whatever uh, other function it may uh, henceforth have, it will not have the same meaning for uh, future parliamentarians who may be elected to it or people who may look at it. Sorry. Yeah. Ah. Can you see dig it? I think you can, hopefully. Yeah. So, uh, India Gate, again, a, a memorial to Indian soldiers who were killed in various wars, uh, most notably the First World War, and later uh, also uh, inscribed on it, uh, those who died in the Afghan War, uh, has become a very important part of the Indian uh, sort of uh, rituals, Indian national rituals like the Republic Day Parade. And this, you see the first Republic Day Parade being held. Uh, you know, right through the arch. And of course, as every site, it has not, a site doesn't stop evolving. It does evolve as well. And additions have been made to the site. And in this case, an important addition has been the addition of the Amar Jawan Jyoti, which was added here. So it, it evolved as a, uh, as a national site. And this is a permanent memorial to uh, all who lay down their lives uh, in military, in a, in a, in, a, uh, in combat, or on active duty uh, in the armed forces. So it's a, a memorial to them. So uh, this this happened in 72, 1972, This memorial was built. Now looking a little bit more closely at the central vista itself, which is um, the the central. Rajpat, the areas around Rajpat. This is a bigger picture of the area itself. This is almost all of New Delhi as it was. Coming a little closer, this is 1942. This is what the Central Vista was. And it has changed. And it had begun to change very, very soon. Now you look at the so some salient points of this vista, what, said, what that, that central thing which says King's Way goes from left to right, that's King's Way, the central one, that is Rajpath. North, south, the main road, that is Janpath. On either side of Rajpath, you can see uh, the water bodies and a lot of open space really, few buildings are there. Look at the 1959 picture. A lot of buildings have already come up over here, which were not there in the 1942 map. There is Krishi Bhavan, there is Utyog Bhavan, the, the National Museum has come up, uh, Vigyan Bhavan has come up. So uh, a lot of these buildings have started to come up. There are a lot of other buildings here also. Uh, in red, many of them were made uh, in the central vista Place. These were old wartime structures, but a lot of this you can see Udyo Bhavan, Krishi Bhavan, uh, Vikyan Bhavan National Museum. Now these were all built between 42 and 59. They were actually all built after independence. So you have the Bhavans. So it's not only Udyo Bhavan and Krishi Bhavan, but uh, later Shastri Bhavan, 
also came up. Uh, Nirban Bhavan came up. This is Vayu Bhavan, the Air Force the, uh, offices. Vigyan Bhavan, which came up. And uh, a very important group of buildings, which was on this, co this crossing of Janpat and Rajpat. Initially, in the, this is the old plan, the old uh, map, which was uh, which was as it had been planned. It had been planned that this crossing would be a sort of a cultural hub. You would have things, the Central Asian Antiquities Museum is being shown there and the record office is being shown there. Central Asian Antiquities Museum at that point had not been properly built. It was meant as a separate one, but it had not been built. The, the uh, records office, which we know as the National Archives, that had been built. But it was designed that these four corners would have cultural institutions, museums, record offices, those kind of things. And this was what was built. This was built by, uh, this was designed by Edwin Luckians uh, and this is the National Archives, the records office. This was the only one of the four buildings that were planned in that site that were actually built. So two more were added after independence. One of them is the National Museum. This is the national, a model of the National Museum. I couldn't have, I didn't have an adequate photograph of the National Museum. So this is what you can see. This is the National Museum that was built after independence. This was an old mess in which was in one of the plots of land, an old bungalow, which was a wartime structure actually. During the war, uh, Second World War, a lot of structures had come up here to house the uh, many overseas troops that were stationed in Delhi. So this was one of them. This was retained and further buildings were added to make the Indira Gandhi National Center for Arts, IGNCA. Now, so this, the fourth plot, unfortunately, the, uh, the, the museum that was planned there did not come up. Instead, you have a Ministry of External Affairs building that came up. So what happened was that this became a cultural hub there were, of course, the other government buildings that were there. And so what happens is, I think one thing that we need to see in the Central Vista project is that what are the buildings that are going to be demolished and what are the buildings that are going to stay? All the buildings that are pre-1947 are actually inscribed by law on a heritage list and they are going to stay. So the building of Parliament House will stay, though it may not be Parliament House anymore, but it will stay. The Central Secretariat buildings will stay. The, the uh, Rashtrapati Bhavan will stay. The National Archives will stay. The, the, the arch, the, which is the uh, India Gate, that's going to stay. So these buildings are going to stay. And the buildings that are going to be demolished are all the buildings that have come up after independence. National Museum is going to go eventually. The, the, all the bhavans will go. Vigyan bhavan will go. Uh, your uh, Krishi bhavan, Udyog bhavan, Nirman bhavan, Shastri bhavan, they will all go. Vayu bhavan, Rail bhavan. All these old bhavans are going to go. They are all going to be demolished. Uh, the India, the, the IGNCA is going to go. So it's, it's odd that in this project, what is going to be destroyed is not a colonial legacy. It's the Indian legacy. It's what uh, the... Now, the, these buildings have a very important uh, role in our nation's history because what happens... Why did so many buildings come up after 1947? Because the colonial state was had very limited functions. It was a state which policed and extracted revenue. It had policing and extracting revenue as its main functions. The more independent nation, the state had a much bigger role. It, therefore, you have a Krishi Bhavan coming in because it's doing a lot more by way of uh, development in ag agriculture. It is taking a much greater role in industry. Therefore, you have uh, uh, Udyog Bhavan coming up. So these kind of things. It's a state which has many more functions. 
it sees itself, its role as a much bigger one, and therefore all these buildings have come up. So this is a sort of a stage in Indian history, the post-independence period, which ironically is the one that is going to be erased in this project rather than the colonial one. So even if you're talking about this being a colonial heritage, what, the part of it which is being uh, erased is actually a very different one. This picture that I have shown is, of course, of the lawns on either side of uh, India, of, of the Central Vista. And these lawns have had a history also, which is equally important as the buildings. Now, it, it, it made for a grand avenue and an impressive avenue, Central Vista. Uh, it was modeled on parallels like the uh, mall, which is in Washington, D.C., the Capitol Hill and the lawns on either side, etc. So it was modeled on those kind of uh, inspirations. But um, so that's how it was modeled. In practice, it also was an unstructured space where which could which became in time a public space. It became a public space. Here you see a photograph from 1945, just before independence, which shows. Uh, people who have come for, you know, every year there is this in the winter, even during, before independence, there used to be some celebrations where uh, delegations used to become, used to come from different parts of the country. And if you have a, a group of dancers who are kind of rehearsing on the lawns of India Gate. If you see a little further, there are people, again, groups of people who are standing around, some are lounging on the grass, etc., so it became a kind of public space. It became a public space. Many of us uh, have memories of this as an open space where we could sit down, relax, uh, eat some snacks. It was a free space. It was an open space. It was also, in fact, a protest site. Many of us uh, who are my generation will remember from our college days uh, um, going here uh, for small little any protests, any demonstrations, etc., used to happen near Boat Club. And so that became a place of protest also. Uh, a very important uh, protest was the farmers' protest of 1988, where you had a huge uh, contingent of a huge group of farmers who protested here for many, many days on end. So uh, it became a public space. So it was reappropriated and reinscribed in the Indian imagination as a place of recreation, but also of protest. Now, what has been happening already is that this space has been, in the past few years, restructured. So, first of all, all the protests were banned. The protests were taken off from here. You could not protest here anymore. This is an aerial view of the National War Memorial Complex, which has come up fairly recently. So what it has done is it has, uh, it has, it has, uh, shall we say, landscaped the place more formally. What was an open space for recreation, for, uh, for, for protest, etc., now becomes a national monument, which is fair enough. Uh, India Gate is also a national monument. But the landscape is extremely formal. So what you have is, uh, what you have is a ha many more hard surfaces rather than earth or grass, much more hard surface. But more importantly, these are surfaces on which people cannot relax. Forget about protesting. They cannot even sit over here. If you have been to the National War Memorial, you will realize that this is not a place where you sit and you uh, have your chana or your ice cream or anything. This is a very, very structured place. You can see there are closed gates and barriers all around. So what was a public space now becomes a more formal, structured, policed space in the form of a war memorial. So it is a war memorial, but more importantly, it's a policed state space. The people are uh, pushed together in a very small area. You will go, if you go there and you experience the area around India Gate, uh, everybody is now pushed into this very, very uh, constricted space around India Gate itself. Uh, we have 
construction right now is on. What is happening right now is the construction and uh, the CPWD had actually shared uh, its uh, landscape plan for this area. What we are seeing here, it's not very detailed, but what we can see is there's going to be much more on those lawns. There's going to be much more paved area uh, and pedestrian underpasses. So what happens with pedestrian underpasses is that pedestrians are pushed underground and the traffic on top becomes faster. So the roads will have faster traffic and people will go underground. So the appreciation of the vista by somebody who is walking will be impaired. So that is going to be impaired. As I said, a lot of the green is going to be replaced by paved areas. And uh, one thing that happens is I talked about a lot of the buildings that are going to be demolished. What I did not mention was that in their place, what is going to come up is a lot of office blocks. So National Museum, that space will be replaced by an office block. The IGNCA is going to be replaced by an office block. Lots of office blocks coming up. Not only these cultural museum hubs will go, but because of the office blocks coming up and the added security that is invariably a part of government offices, the atmosphere of this place as an open public area will disappear. It will be much more landscaped, much more sculpted, and uh, much less informal. It will become an informal place. Uh, in in, uh, in uh, I think government parlance, the word beautification is again and again used. It will become a beautiful place, good for photographs maybe, but uh, not a live space. So uh, this is what is happening to a public space, uh, which is a historic public space. So where we started with the colonial state, which had its, um, during colonial times also, this was a fairly pristine place. It was not uh, one of those, you know, it was not very crowded, etc. But part of that was because it was, Delhi was not very populous at that time. But uh, this now brings it full circle what has been happening between independence and now of this becoming a place of protest and of public uh, of public recreation, etc., that is going to be dialed back and we will have a much more formal space which will, um, uh, which will look different, feel different from what it is now. So uh, really, I, am, uh, I have more or less come to an end uh, of what I had to say. I will be happy to expand on, uh, answer whatever questions you have. And if you have any further uh, queries about some of the stuff I have said, I'll be happy to uh, talk about that as well. This is, the, this is the lighting scheme that used to be there earlier every year during the uh, 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 Republic Day celebrations. It used to be lit like this. This scene, unfortunately, is now gone forever. Now we have those colored lights uh, which light up the Secretariat's uh, but I'm going to stop uh, presenting this now and uh, let's stop this. Sorry. Okay. Right. So uh, that is pretty much what I had to say. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Uh, can I ask you a question, Sapna? Uh, it's a, uh, can, I, can I ask a question? Yes, ma'am, sure. It was a wonderful, wonderful presentation, I would say, and too enlightening for us. We were all wondering why the Central Vista project has come up in the first place. And this is precisely what I want to ask you, Sapna. What is the rationale? Because every time a new project would come up, there has to be some justification that you say that it has got nothing to do with the colonial world now because the colonial blocks are going to stay as if they are. It's the new world that is coming up. How does the government, how does the new state justify the, the, the redoing of Central Vista now? Uh, there has been surprisingly little, little uh, communication on this project. And uh, really, it has, it was first, the initiation was with Parliament House and it was seen as uh, something that was utilitarian. Uh, because mm -hmm. Parliament is uh, allegedly not um, uh, earthquake uh, resistant, it does not have enough room for expansion, etc. And all these things were said without doing any proper 
case audits. You know, there are heritage audits that can be done to make to find out if, how a building can be adapted. The people right. who are in charge of building the new building cannot do that audit because they are interested parties. This has to be done by an independent agency. So I don't think that has been done. So, but it was pushed as a utilitarian uh, project. You know, it's so inconvenient. Uh, they don't have enough room. It's inconvenient that the prime minister lives so far from parliament and, you know, he, his movements uh, cause uh, traffic problems. So he needs a new house there. Uh, and, you know, the, the, there are no amenities amenities on uh, Central Vista, so they have to be built. So it becomes, it's framed in uh, these kind of, uh, from the official side, it is framed in these utilitarian terms. And on an unofficial side, there's a lot of rhetoric about colonial, sweeping away the colonial past. And as I said, uh, that also, these are arguments that are not convincing at all. So, uh, uh, you know, that's, it's not very clear. It's not articulated very clearly at all. So it becomes very difficult to counter it also, because you, if it's not articulated properly, then you don't, in fact, there's been very, a lot of misinformation as to what will stay, what will not stay, what is going. So therefore, I did go into a little bit of the background also because there's a lot of uh, confusion about that. Absolutely, especially at a time when we find that we are going through a very bad patch of economy. <laughs> An entire redoing of things, and so these questions do come up in the mind. But thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for that talk. In case anybody has questions, you can put them on the chat box and we'll take you one by one. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Uh, I have one question. So, I really like the talk and uh, right now I'm doing one presentation with Shah Jahanabad. So, I'm now thinking of adding this in, in the, like, in the conclusion. Because, yeah. So, I had some th this uh, doubt. Like, like, uh, this is going to happen again. Now we have uh, lots of heritage that we consider it colonial, but the main, uh, like the main subjects, like the people were Indians who used that uh, heritage, and they lived in that in they lived in that culture heritage. So, uh, what we as a citizen can do if the government is thinking uh, differently? So, what we can do to preserve? these heritages in future reports? It's, it's a difficult question because, you know, these are buildings with, and areas which are so much under the control of um, the government that, you know, as citizens, we then have limited roles. I mean, even though we raise our voices and we, uh, you know, put in the official objections and, you know, there are limits, there have been uh, court cases, etc. against it, but there are, there are limits to how, what we can do. I think one of the things that we really owe ourselves is to be better informed. I think we need to be informed of ourselves about what is going on, what our heritage is, what our history is. And uh, it is happening. It is happening. But there is a huge amount of misinformation and counter, uh, 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 you know, basically poor history, which is being taught in, in the guise of history. What is being taught is uh, misinformation. So therefore, uh, that that uh, is a very very important uh, uh, you know it's a serious factor that has to be considered as far as heritage is concerned i mean there's a lot that uh, you know heritage first of all we must realize that heritage is about people heritage is different from history history is history heritage i mean you know in that sense heritage is uh, it's the obviously it's the past and what uh, you know, uh, you know the legacy of the past that is carrying on here, but it is also about so much more about what, uh, how these sites have to be managed, what it's the practical problems of it, etc. But uh, I think very importantly, one has to keep in mind that it is people who use these, and it's people for whom these have this has meaning, and uh, I think we have to define what that meaning is. And we have to, uh, again, it, it, it requires, uh, very often what happens is that 
local communities are often ignored when it comes to heritage. And this is a wider question I'm making. I mean, you know, this I couldn't bring that in into Central Vista so much, except to say that, you know, this was people used to use this and less and people are being pushed out to the corners. But often what I, I see is happening in uh, Delhi also is this uh, pushing out of people. You know, the lawns outside Red Fort when I was young were a place where people children played football and cricket and people relaxed and had picnics and all that. All that has been manicured in the name of beautification and cleaning it up. And it was fenced away and people cannot use those lawns anymore. Why? You know, this is, this is, uh, these are questions that we should uh, really be talking about and we should try and defend our rights as citizens to public uh, places and our uh, ways of uh, using heritage sites also. Thank you so much, ma'am, for answering the question. Do we have any other questions? I can't see anything in the chat either. Incidentally, uh, Shahjanabad uh, is also seeing a makeover, right? And if you have seen it, uh, since we have a little bit of time, let me just talk about that. Also, said Muskan said that she, uh, Muskan, right? Who asked yes, the question? Ma'am. Yeah. Yes. Since we were talking about Shahjanabad, let's also discuss that a little bit. And again, uh, I think my main uh, problem with the makeover project. First of all, let me talk about the positives. Every site needs to adapt to new, uh, you know, it was built in a time when there was no electrical uh, uh, systems. So electricity was put in and therefore all these electric cables used to hang in front of the buildings. Now that has been put underground. It's a wonderful safety measure. It should be done. Infrastructure should improve. Modernization of infrastructure should happen. So that is very, very, it's a good idea, great news. Pedestrianization. Yes, of course, in Mughal times, it was pedestrianized. It was pedestrian because there was no mode of transport. However, today, I think the, pro the justification for pedestrianization was that it is, um, you know, there are, it's very crowded and people find it very difficult to navigate the area. Now, the problem was not that it was, the road was narrow, it was crowded because the road was narrow, but there was huge amount of traffic mismanagement. There was people parking everywhere, uh, all sorts of encroachments, etc. And that was causing a congestion. So it meant, you know, if we had only managed it better, it would have sorted itself out. Now, what happens when you have pedestrianization is that you are not giving people a choice. And there are some people for whom it's inconvenient and it's going to be inconvenient. So that is uh, pedestrianization. Sometimes it becomes necessary. But as I said, in this case, it was not necessary because it is a fairly wide road. Secondly, I think uh, when we make choices, it, that lots of red sandstone is used in the construction. I think we have to look at the Bukals themselves did not use red sandstone in the site when it was built. It was not paved with red sandstone. It has been paved now. Now we should be looking at most, uh, more sustainable solutions. Now, if a part of the red fort falls off, yes, please put red sandstone there because that was what was originally there, but not in Chowmichor. I think not on the road at least, not in the road, not in pavements. So this is one thing that I again say that we should be looking at sustainable solutions also. And we should be looking at improving the quality of life of people who live in Chaira how can they be made more comfortable and uh, you know upgraded the, without destroying heritage? Because it's all about people. A city without the, looking at the people is nothing. Ma'am, uh, I really want to ask what's your view on the beautification of Chandni Chowk? Sorry? Uh, what's your view on the beautification of Chandni Chowk? Like uh, it got beautified recently, no? 
yeah, which is what I uh, just mentioned about Chamicha. I also feel that this, I, I, I don't, I don't like this word beautification. I think we should not be thinking of beautification. We should be thinking of making a space uh, meaningful in terms of its history, its current use, and convenience of people. I think that's what we should be looking at. Beauty is a, as a concept with, uh, in terms of uh, how good a photograph it turns out is a very shallow uh, idea of what a place should be. I mean, uh, you know, so uh, I think we need to go be beyond the surface. If I would have been happier if, you know, all the streets of Shahjanabad, all the hanging electricity cables had been put underground. If the drainage had been settled so that people did not have flooding, which happens every year really badly, people, their basements are flooded all the time. It, it's, uh, it's bad. So those kind of things need to be looked at. How to improve the functioning of the old city uh, as a city rather than simply beautification. Um, I had a question uh, just before we end. Uh, but how do you draw the line between you know infrastructural development and preserving heritage? Like where is the line? And secondly, um, don't you think to an extent our entire idea of beautification and modernization is just following very Western ideals? For example, we're ignoring the actual beauty of Chandni Chowk, which was the chaos, which was the people, and trying to fit it into a very picturesque idea of um, red sandstone and having it done, a, done up a certain way. You are very right. That That is very much this. So, you know, in fact, the whole idea of clearing up the, of cleaning up, cleaning up and beautification, these are two things that are used a lot in official parlance. The cleaning up of the lawns in front of Red Fort was all about this. You remove people. If you, re you know, it has to have lawns. And those lawns have to look bright, beautiful and green. And they cannot look beautiful and green if people are playing games there. So what do you do? Remove the people. And you'll have beautiful lawns. That is the, that is what we have to fight against. The idea that it has to be pristine in some... Uh, you know, lawns are a completely uh, non-starter in a place like Delhi with its climate and all that. And the people. And, you know, we, we cannot... That is not what we should be aiming for. Shahjanabad, we should not be aiming for a museum piece, which looks beautiful in terms of a, a, a Western European historic town. It's not, because it is an Indian town. It can look beautiful in its own terms. With all the people, with all the kinds of shops that are there, that is what it's about. So, you know, so that's where uh, the, the whole uh, question of what the aesthetics is. I, I also feel, you know, uh, the, where the Central Vista thing is coming from. Uh, I've been to Singapore and there the idea of landscaping in the city that I often see is either, the gra either it's beautifully grassed, and perfectly green. If it's not, it has to be paved over. You don't want to see any earth. You know, there's no earth. It all has to be beautifully paved or greened and antiseptic. You know, uh, so those are uh, the kind of values that we are trying to uh, get here. And because we cannot have those values, because it's just uh, our cities are so much more, uh, shall we say, living. So you create these pockets, which you then empty of people to achieve that ideal of beauty that you have set before you. So you can have a red fort, which is surrounded by these beautiful green lawns as an island in uh, a city which is more normal around it. And then you proceed to ignore the city altogether because you don't even bother to improve the infrastructure there. Again, you know, the beautification of Chandni Chowk is to create a one island which will photograph beautifully, <laughs> which you can say that, you, you know, so much has been done. And similarly with Central Vista, you'll make this very beautifully paved and greened and grassed area in the center, which will be empty of people. Because that's the only way you can maintain it, if it's empty of people. So I think 
uh, you know, those values have to be questioned. What are we trying to create? I would like to thank Dr. Liddell for giving us the opportunity to have her with us for the talk. It was a very interesting and thought-provoking session and on the crossroads that we stand due to modernization. Thank you to everyone who joined us today for the talk. Your participation is highly appreciated. Thank you, ma'am.